Good afternoon, everyone. It's November 18th, and welcome to Mythbusters Demystifying Robotic Bronchoscopy. Uh, it's an honor and privilege to be joined by my two co panelists today, Dr. Mihir Parikh, um, who is an interventional pulmonologist at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and Dr. Scott O, oh, who is the lead interventional pulmonologist at UCLA. Uh, my name is Jenny Reisenauer. I'm a thoracic surgeon and interventional pulmonologist at Mayo Clinic. On behalf of CHEST, I'd like to thank everyone for joining and a special thank you to CHEST for contributing to uh, all of our education surrounding this new technology and the opportunity to have uh, somewhat of an opinionated discussion about the various technologies that are out there. The format of today will have a few uh, cases uh, that should last about three to four minutes. And then we've tried to build in some of the questions that were submitted earlier, but to the audience members that are joining, please don't let that hold you back from asking provocative questions in the chat box. We are well armed and well prepared to answer any provocative questions that you may come up with. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. O to show his case and we'll answer some questions thereafter. Great, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. Uh, so we're gonna start things off with a, a brief case to kind of uh, start thinking about and, and focusing our discussion on, on the topic uh, at hand today, which is robotic bronchoscopy. So this is probably a, a situation that we're all quite familiar with. It's a 76 year old man, prior smoking history, 15 pack years, not a heavy smoker, came into the ED with atypical chest pain because uh, he had a non STEMI a couple of years ago, and uh, undergoes a CT of the chest, and the CT shows an incidental um, eight, nine millimeter pulmonary nodule uh, in the left upper lobe. And I'm going to, uh, if you could uh, focus your attention here on the left lung, right near the um, heart there, and you can see we just passed it up. Uh, I'm going to bring up my point here if I can. Here we go. Everyone can see my dot here. Here's that very small uh, pulmonary nodule here uh, in that, um, sorry, in that uh, left upper lobe right next to the pericardium. So this is a, a, a lesion I think that um, I wouldn't have even thought about trying to go after bronchoscopically uh, in the past. Um, but with the technology that's now available, wow, my computer is going a little haywire, apologies. Um, we're able to uh, get to that spot using robotic bronchoscopy. You can see the floral image here. And one of the key things about robotic bronchoscopy and, and, and I think bronchoscopic sampling, we're pretty good at getting there to the lesion here. And as you can see here by the radial EVA signal, that um, the lesion is right here, but it's not a circumferential uh, le lesion. And that's kind of what's kind of expected based on the CT scan as the uh, airway looked like it uh, was tangential or uh, abutting the lesion, but uh, was not uh, clearly an air bronchogram sign. And I think what's important here and what, what highlights um, one of the major advantages is that here we are, um, and I know where the lesion is relative to uh, the airway, but my, if I were to take a biopsy here, my needle would just go straight down the airway. Sorry. I think I have to get out of my uh, spotlight view here. And what the advantage here is, uh, if I know where in this airway the lesion is, I can direct my uh, catheter to pay, uh, point right at the lesion. So now my lesion, my needle is going to go through that wall into the target of where I think it is. And sure enough, uh, the biopsies confirmed a diagnosis of a low-grade neuroendocrine tumor, typical findings on an HNE stain chromogranin positive with a low proliferative index. So this is a, a, a lesion that we would, I wouldn't have thought of biopsying before but we're able to really drive out to the target with a lot more precision than before, park our uh, catheter exactly where we want, and not only just park it, but aim and manipulate the tip of the catheter to aim it directly into the lesion um, outside of the airway, then biopsy the, uh, the target 
with much more um, precision, precision than before. So uh, I don't want to take up too much time here. So I just want to stop uh, there. And um, uh, maybe, uh, I don't know if we want to stop and take questions now or go on to the next case. Yeah. The, I mean, so there's a couple of questions that actually came in that, that highlights what you showed beautifully. You know, you showed how radial lebus sometimes can give you an eccentric signal and knowing where you are on the CT and the orientation of the airway can help turn that eccentric signal into a positive diagnostic yield. Um, there, not everybody is a user of radial probe. And, and what do you say to that? Do you use it in conjunction? Do you think you, you know, how do you think those two pieces of technology, meaning radial probe and robotic bronchoscopy, how would you compare the two as individual technologies and then, and then in, in conjunction with, with one another? Yeah, I think it's really important um, to understand uh, the lesion you're going after. Uh, if you look at all the data that's out there, um, I think we have to understand the benefits of the tools that we're using and also the limitations. So radial EBUS probe alone, I think a lot of us has gotten to the lesion, right? We see these studies posted or published describing how the navigation was a success. You get to the lesion, you get a radial EBUS signal, but the yield is much, much lower, significantly lower than the navigation, quote unquote, yield. And I think a lot of that has to do with not being able to direct your needle into the lesion directly um, and combining the use of radial EBUS and robotic bronchoscopy where you can really articulate the tip exactly where you want and have it stable enough to stay there while you pass your biopsy tools through really is complementary. Um, for example, here in this, this image I have of the uh, 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 view of the, of the real-time view through the, through the robotic bronchoscope, um, by being able to articulate the catheter off to the side a little bit to the wall, I know when I put my radial EBUS probe out that it's going to be touching that wall. And if I get a signal there, I can be pretty confident that my needle is going to be going into my target um, uh, exactly where I, uh, the lesion is. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And, and you showed a nice case here on the bottom left is a, is a kind of peripericardial peri lesion. And then bottom right is pleural lesion. So in terms of when you get out there and you know you're there and you've got a good signal, do your biopsy tools change based on where you are? You know, there's multiple sizes and all this kind of stuff. Do you have a specific algorithm that you always follow? What's kind of your strategy briefly in, in what tool you use once you get out there? I think it's a general rule of the thumb um, because a needle can go through the airway wall as well as into a lesion that's endobronchial. It's no surprise to me that a needle gives you an overall higher diagnostic yield. But there are certain situations where I shy away from the needle, especially if I'm going after a, a small pleural based lesion and um, the, th the, your, the lesion is only maybe abutting the pleura, it's only a centimeter big it's really hard to get good needle samples um, throw, uh, with a passing the needle through a lesion that small, that's pleural based. So in that situation, I really um, reach more for my forceps. But we have kind of a, a protocolized approach where we have on-site cytology, where we do needle first, then we do brush, then we do forceps. And actually at our center, we do cryobiopsies with a 1.1 probe through the robot, and that gives us surprisingly uh, a significant amount of additional benefit in our yields based on anecdotal data, which hopefully will turn into non-anecdotal data, uh, non -anecdotal data uh, in the near future. We're gonna look for that abstract at the next national meeting, because there's a <laughs> lot of interest in that. Um, we're, we're kind of the same way. I mean, I think one of the things that came out of the original Navigate study was this positive bronchosign and, and endobronchial component. And I think we're finding with this technology that fewer and fewer nodules have to have an endobronchial component or have to have an airway sign, but many more of these are extrinsic to the airway. And I think that's why you have to start with the needle first, right? To almost burrow a hole through the airway and get access to that nodule. And then based on, um, you know, people that have done cases with me kind of laugh because I, I take four, no matter what, no matter what the cytologist says, we're doing four needles. 
And then based upon what kind of feedback you get, it's either forceps or brush or upsize the needle. And then it becomes a back and forth between you and the rose person based on what they're seeing. And, and then you develop your own algorithm based on the experiences that you've had. What, what's your kind of algorithm, Dr. Parikh, out, out there for sampling? Strategy. Same. It's nice to hear that we're all sort of in the same sort of uh, approach to it. I definitely start with the needle first for the same reasons you guys are describing. I think it's important to be able to poke a hole in the airway and sort of jumping back to the previous discussion about radial ebus. I don't know if you guys find this to be true, but I tend to repeat radial ebus along the way just to make sure that I haven't moved. You know, that that's probably a, a holdover from my you know prior days where, you know, some instruments didn't have the same sort of stability that I enjoy with the robot. But it is nice to check in. And I, I find, I don't know if you guys do that over time, that the eccentric image on the radio ebus sometimes becomes more concentric as I'm able to like burrow the hole and actually create my own bronchus sign into the, into the lesion, to the target. Um, so that's a nice sort of addition to make me feel even better about my location. And then I certainly move on to brush. And then, you know, forceps, I, I, I sometimes shy away from the closer I get to the plural surface, just because I agree the needle seems to have the best diagnostic tool and I'm getting good feedback from the Rose uh, team, then it may not be necessary. Have you guys looked at molecular analysis with the needle? It's something we haven't done yet. We're starting to do it in a prospective format, but the biggest question is going to come down to these cases that are post SBRT recurrence or whatever. And are you getting enough for molecular with the needle because some lesions are just not safe to sample with a forceps, right? Or because of that tip bend radius, you can't get a good forceps through. Are you finding with the flexision needles that you're getting enough for molecular sampling or is that really variable based on the tumor type? We found it to be your, the second, uh, very, really dependent on the cellularity of the lesion. Yeah. Um, and, and that seems to be for us at least the, the most, uh, the driving factor on whether or not enough there's enough uh, uh, carcinomatous cellularity to be able to run um, the moleculars and next generation sequencing and even the more advanced uh, microsatellite instability, et cetera, uh, analyses of, of, of the samples. Yeah, I can take a look back. It's a good question. We haven't really looked at it that closely. You know, most of the ones that we've, uh, we see are oftentimes early stage tumors where the molecular profiling isn't as exactly. critical, but uh, it's a great question. Okay, maybe we can do a multi-center study after this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dr. Parik, I'm gonna jump to, to your presentation if you wanna share your screen and, and pull up your case. Sure. And again, I, I, I encourage participants to submit questions to the chat box as, as our cases get shown and as we bring up perhaps interesting points for subsequent discussion. Great. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, and uh, thank you again for the invitation. Happy to be here. I'm one of the interventional pulmonologists at Beth Israel in Boston uh, and one of the um, faculty here at Harvard. And so uh, I'll do a quick case here. This is a 69 year old former smoker with incidentally found right lower lobe nodule seen on a plane film uh, when the patient came in for an episode of bronchitis. Um, this is the lesion in question. It's uh, fairly peripheral in the right upper lobe. Um, it had a little bit of mixed attenuation, some surrounding ground glass to it, uh, and was quite peripheral, as we talked about. And I'll, I'll take you through the procedure. If some people haven't seen what the navigation looks like um, on the screen, uh, this is what you see on the monitors for the, uh, for the ion robotic bronchoscopy platform. At the top is sort of your bird's eye view of, uh, you know, where you are in relationship to the target lesion. And on the bottom are the more active views on the right is the fluoroscopy and on the left is the radial ebus. And you get to see all this together uh, as you line up towards the target. And so when we first reached out to this peripheral lesion, I, I'm a big believer in radial ebus and we sent the radial ebus out and we didn't, we got what looked like maybe a, a eccentric view to it. And um, you know, one of the things that along the lines of what Dr. O was talking about earlier uh, that I've come to learn and appreciate over time with uh, with my use of the technology is that you are able to, as he said, articulate with intent. Uh, and you're able to you know, take this eccentric image um, and go back to the CT scan and understand what the relationship is of the lesion uh, in target and the airway. And then with intent to move the, the, the rigid, uh, the move the bronchoscope in a way that will line you up directly into the lesion, as he said. And that's what we did in this case. And so we took this eccentric image and then adjusted um, 
the uh, I'm just going to advance the video a little bit into this time. Uh, advance the um, uh, it moved the bronchoscope in a direction a little bit. Uh, just in what I thought would be a better lineup to the lesion. And you can see that happening with the ball moving a little bit in the bottom image and then sending the radio ebus out again. And here getting a little bit more concentric of an image. And, and that eventually uh, was where we biopsied. And here we found an invasive adenocarcinoma um, and eventually the patient went on for uh, surgical resection. Um, you know, I, I, what I like to do this, we have a big teaching program here uh, at the institution with our IP fellows. And this is one of the procedures where you really need to uh, learn how to do it uh, by doing it. And um, I did one of the things I talk about with our IP fellows over the course of the year in general, but also when it comes to learning any specific technique, something called the Dunning-Kruger effect and, and something I've come to appreciate uh, as an important part of how we learn new skills. And this is the relationship between confidence on the y-axis and competence or procedural skill or knowledge on the x-axis. And it's not a linear relationship. The learning curve isn't linear. Uh, there's a high uh, sort of jump in confidence early on called the peak amount stupid that doesn't necessarily correlate with uh, procedural skill or knowledge. Um, and I, we, we had a similar experience here. I felt like we had a couple of early successes with the robot. I was feeling really good about it. And then when we started to push the envelope of the types of lesions we were going after, we really understood that it does take time to refine the technique and really come to um, a, a really a, a mastery level, which is, you know, takes a long time to go after. And uh, eventually we got there. So that was just my sort of brief take on my experience with robot, uh, but happy to take questions as well. I think the learning curve is a really, really important point that I'd like to come back to and circle around. But, um, you know, one, one of the things that comes up is, is for like the nodule and the case and stuff that you showed before, you know, both of you are at very prestigious institutions and like, uh, like at ours, our radiologists have a diagnostic yield rate of about 92 to 95% with a 3.5% pneumothorax rate. Um, and and obvious, there's an obvious benefit to robotic bronchoscopy in those institutions where maybe you don't have an interventional radiologist that's comfortable or wants to do cases. But how does this fit in to those institutions such as yours, uh, Dr. Parikh, where I imagine your radiologists are also very good and you have very low pneumothorax rates? How, how do you collaborate with them or compete with them or whatever the term might be um, in terms of who fits into this algorithm versus another? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I like to think of it as more collaborative, I think, than competitive, but hopefully my colleagues in radiology feel the same. Um, uh, it, it's part of, we, we have a nice program here where, you know, patients are referred to the the, the nodule program, and it's, it, 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 it's a lot of uh, back and forth about what the right uh, procedure is for the right patient. And, you know, it's important to bring in the patient component of it as well as to, you know, what their goals are and what their uh, concerns are and what they want to get out of the procedure. I think there's a couple of things that we can offer with the bronchoscopic approach that can't be offered percutaneously. I think most of, one of the most important considerations is the ability to stage the mediastinum, which is not possible um, in a percutaneous approach. Um, and then, you know, at our, our, ultimately, we hope to get to a point where we can apply therapeutics, and that, that's sort of a whole different topic to discuss. But, you know, ultimately, the goal is to become a one-stop shop for a patient where you're able to uh, take a patient with a lung nodule in one setting, perform the diagnosis, the staging, and the therapy. And I think building towards that from a robotic approach is, is the goal. Um, we don't have great head-to-head -to -head comparisons with which to really understand, uh, you know, the pros and cons of either approach, percutaneous or bronchoscopic. But I think that's, you know, potential for more studies to come out of this. I agree, particularly in the molecular marker setting, right? Because yeah. that's one of the biggest reasons that people sometimes get percutaneous CT guided biopsies as opposed to EBUS, because there's some older data out there suggesting that EBUS is not as good for molecular markers, even though that's not been our experience, but it, it brings up a good point. But you brought up something and I promised provocative questions. So I'm gonna be a little bit provocative with this question. Do you think that we're now staging, you know, the NCCN guideline says consider mediastinal staging for patients with a lesion greater than a centimeter in size, right? But if that patient is a surgical candidate anyways, and there's no evidence of PET or CT lymphadenopathy, are we now just using staging to justify a robotic bronchoscopy in that patient? 
or should we be staging those patients with an EBUS? In which case you can make an argument to biopsy at the same time. Yeah. And I'd love to hear Dr. O's opinion on this one too, after, after you answer. Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. I, I, I think that the, the data is outstanding. It's not, it's, uh, I shouldn't say outstanding. I think the data is not entirely clear on how to answer that question. I think we're seeing more and more discussion about um, uh, the, the presence of uh, radiographic or clinically silent nodal metastases in lesions that are much smaller than what we traditionally thought would have like silent nodal metastases. And so I think we need to be uh, a little bit thoughtful about relying on uh, these guidelines that were based on data that may be outdated. Uh, but I'm curious to hear what others think about that. Yeah, so I, I think it's, you know, I'm a firm believer that all patient treatment decisions come down to a clinical trial with an N of one, right? We take all that data and we apply it to the patient in front of us. I think there are the one, the cases that are clearly that should be done bronchoscopically. And those are the ones where there's a lesion and a patient with a lot of emphysema. It's in the middle of a lobe. You got to get through a lot of bad lung before you get to it. There's a clear airway to it. And there's a suspicious node on imaging. I mean, that's a slam dunk, should be done bronchoscopically. Then there's the slam dunk, should be done percutaneously. Pleural-based, the chance of a pneumothorax, really, really low, complication, really, really low, chip shot for the interventional radiologist, really small, really peripheral, chance of nodal disease, very, very unlikely. Uh, and if there is, it's probably going to be N1 that's going to be taken at surgery anyways. I think those cases should be done percutaneously. And that's our practice. Those, those kind of slam dunk cases go to their appropriate um, kind of uh, uh, workflow. Um, fortunately, we have a nodule conference where we can bring up cases, uh, screen detected and incidental, where we have radiologists, interventional radiologists, pulmonologists, thoracic surgeons, and we discuss cases that we find particularly interesting to discuss. And we've all kind of learned from each other the risks and benefits of certain approaches. For example, there's nuances. Look, this I wouldn't have noticed this, but the typical approach they would take with the percutaneous biopsy for this nodule has a vessel right in the way. And although it seemed like on initial review, a, a CT Gaia biopsy was the way to go, a bronchoscopic approach made sense. So learning all those nuances makes sense. And also left upper lobe lesions are different than right upper lobe lesions because the nodal metastases tend to be in stations that are hard to reach by EVAS. Um, so then, you know, that makes it a less compelling argument for left upper lobe lesions. So, and then there's those cases that are really in between and, um, and, and that has to be just kind of uh, figured out on a case by case um, um, basis. But we have found that, um, uh, and, uh, that, Staging the mediastinum um, does find uh, unexpected N2 disease, which is really, really significant clinically. Um, the number needed to uh, biopsy to get to that really depends on the pretest probability. Uh, histologic subtype suspected, location, size, and all those nuances that predict a false negative radiographic staging of the mediastinum. And so all those nuances, I think, um, come into play. Uh, when you make these decisions on on which way to go as far as bronchoscopic versus a percutaneous approach. I, I love the collaboration that echoed from both of your responses, because I think that's really the only way to answer this question. Number one, we need data and we need good trials. And number two, we need collaboration. And um, I, I think the, the, I, I think it was Dr. Parikh that said it, but the guidelines are based on the best data and the best technology that's available at that time. So who knows if the paradigm will shift um, you know, in, in the future. And, and I think that that's kind of an important um, consideration. Um, I'll go ahead and, and jump into to my case here and, and we'll keep the conversations going. Uh, the case that I have to show is a 59 year old male who smoked for five years uh, at, the, at age 16, pretty insignificant history of smoking, relatively speaking and was diagnosed with an eight millimeter right lower lobe nodule in 2015. Uh, and then when he returned for follow-up this year, it had grown to 15 millimeters and was speculated in size. The PET scan, uh, the radiologist comments on no FDG AVID uptake in the nodule or mediastinum or hyalur nodes. Um, and, and all this workup was done at an outside hospital. And then he was sent uh, to me. Of note, the patient had a BMI of 54. 
so the pretest probability of malignancy here is high, and I'll show his CT scan. Uh, the only thing that kind of speaks against it is this fact that it's somewhat lobulated or, or well circumscribed and not super spiculated, I guess I would say. Um, and, and we had some conversations with the patient, and despite adequate pulmonary function testing, because of his body mass index, he's just not the greatest candidate for a surgery in a wedge resection. I mean, that's a, it's a very medial, it would involve extensive dissection of the inferior pulmonary ligament. You could see his diaphragm is very, fairly elevated and visualization here would be quite poor. Um, and so the patient was actually opting for empiric radiation. And, and, and again, guidelines would suggest he should get empiric SBRT. And, but the patient was requesting a biopsy ahead of time with an EBUS and so we offered that to him. And just to show when we put this in the planning laptop, it parked us 17 millimeters away with an exit angle of 21 uh, millimeters. So you know it's going to be a tough case ahead of time because it abuts the diaphragm. But then you put it in the planning laptop and it parks you so far away. It makes you kind of nervous about your success rates. Um, but but it, this case, I, I hope to show the value of imaging in addition to just the radial ebus, because we drive out based on the navigation. This wrong turn, quote unquote, in the subway view indicates that if you follow the navigation pathway to a T and it's still telling you you're taking a wrong turn, that is telling you divergence. Divergence is happening. Pay attention to the divergence. And rightly so, we're pointed at the target and we get no radial signal. We use mobile portable CT imaging during our cases, and this would suggest that we have bypassed the nodule in question. You can see our tool is beyond the lesion, which would explain why we're not getting a signal. So we re-articulated based on our CT imaging, because in again, a patient like this, when your divergence is terrible, your target is gonna be off, your subway view is gonna be off. Really the only thing you have to go based upon is your radial view and your real-time imaging. Uh, and so we re-navigated to the point where we finally got a radial EBUS signal and we spun and confirmed that we were in fact tool and lesion. And just to move the case along, here's just a picture of us, uh, you know, uh, after having taken a couple of biopsies, we put our radial probe back out again to the point that was made earlier. And now we continue to subsequently get a better and better signal. Uh, and this patient ended up having small cell. Uh, carcinoma, and not only small cell, but a positive occult station seven, and the, his entire treatment pathway changed um, from what was going to be empiric focal SBRT to focused um, uh, chemotherapy, consolidated chemo radiation therapy, and possibly prophylactic cranial irradiation. So, you know, I, I think it, the, this case, I wanted to bring up the, the imaging, um, and, and what should drive the use of this technology? You know, should we do things based on clinical utility or diagnostic rate? And, and that's one of the questions that came in and, and what drives the use? You know, sometimes we have a piece of technology and it's like, okay, it's great. Let's use it on every single case. Should we be using it on every single case? You know, I don't know the answer to that. Something that's three and a half centimeters that you can get to with a P190 and a radial probe, is it worth it? No, but... You know, I think the three cases that we've shown here are, are really good examples of conventional techniques not working. Um, do either of you will have a comment or a thought on, on, on whether everything's a nail and we're now holding hammers or how should we use it? I think it's hard to come up with, you know, hard and fast rules in the situation. You know, I like the, uh, the, the concept of you know, like every patient's an N of, or every study's an N of one, or how Dr. Rowe was describing it, you know, coming at it from a multidisciplinary approach, you know, including colleagues from radiology, as well as thoracic surgery and oncology, um, to come to a consensus on what the best tool is for every individual patient. I, I you know, I, I, I think it's a fantastic point you bring up that, you know, just because we do have access to this technology shouldn't be the reason why we're using it. I think we have to be much more thoughtful with this, uh, with, with, with this technology, otherwise we run the risk of, you know, adding to the the waste that is apparent in the Amer uh, American healthcare. Um, so I, I guess my non-answer to that question is it's hard to answer it, but I think a multidisciplinary consensus approach is is key. Yeah, I feel like uh, in, in, depending on your practice, you know, we we have three goals at, at academic institutions. I feel like the three pillars, right? Patient care comes first. 
um, education and research. So on some level, um, we want to get our trainees as much exposure as possible and training them on the chip shots are a great way to train uh, people on how to use the technology and become familiar with it. Once you become, once, once uh, you've become the guru or competent in the learning curve that Dr. Farik showed, then maybe you can be a little bit more judicious in when you use technology, being a little bit, being more mindful of the, of the cost and such. But it, it, early on, um, getting uh, yourself familiar with the technology, uh, getting the staff you work with familiar with the technology, I think is important. And having a well-oiled uh, team with experience has an impact on your outcomes. So maybe the, the types of cases you choose to do will evolve um, as uh, your experience and, and your, your center's experience changes. To that point, once you, I, I did, had the same, I, I did 10 cases. I was like 100% diagnostic yield. I was feeling great about myself. And then I went to that darn right lower lobe. And my yield like nosedived. And then it took a little bit of time to come back up to where it's fairly reliable now. But once you have an eno enough cases under your belt and you're bringing these yields and this technology to your tumor boards and, and radiation oncologists in particular are listening, are you seeing more and more nodules referred for biopsy that otherwise would have gone for empiric SBRT as in this case? Yeah, we've definitely seen a significant uptick um, in like month by month almost uh, in the number of cases that are being referred because uh, people are surprised that we were able to get the answer on, on particular cases. And those cases, when we bring it back, circle it back to tumor board or nodule conference, whatever it may be, People are like, oh, wow, this really is a meaningful improvement compared to uh, the historical standards. I think one of the hardest cases to do is a nodule that has some nodularity or growth post SPRT in a patient that got empiric SPRT. And now they're asking you to go back and not only prove recurrence, but get moleculars. Dr. Parikh, have you been in that situation? That, those are really hard because those airways are so fibrotic. The needle won't pass through the airway very easily. It's very acellular material, and you almost wish that it would have. They would have just had tissue up front. Have you found your that? I had a case. Agreed. It's also case. hard to know where in the lesion to target, right? Because you don't know how much of it is just scar left over from the the prior therapy. Um, you know, you almost wish like you had real time PET imaging to give you an idea of where the most like. Uh, you know, lesionable, lesional material is going to be found. So that's why it does help to rely on rows and rely on, uh, you know, different aspects that you might go through through the procedure to, to really uh, optimize that procedure. But yeah, I agreed. I mean, it begs the question, should we be confirming diagnosis in all of these beforehand, uh, either if they go for SBRT or resection? And, you know, again, the guidelines may not suggest that that's indicated, but I think, again, those guidelines are relying on studies that were done in technology that may not be relevant anymore. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think time will tell. You know, um, we had some questions come in, and again, feel free to send in messages through the chat box. You know, one person commented that the case I showed might have been a chip shot to wedge with the robot, which I agree, it probably would have been easier robotically than bats, but in this case, the patient ended up with a positive station seven as well, which I think was kind of the unique thing about this case. Um, you know, you do the best you can with what you can. And I think that's kind of the point that we're trying to ho drive home with these cases. But um, how, how do you think the, the, the you know, t talking about robot separate from the non-robotic systems that are out there and, and not to call anybody out directly by name, but there's a ton out there lung vision, Illumisai, there, and, and if you were to lump all of those non-robotic systems against the robotic systems, Dr. Parikh, you know, a question came in, is it worth purchasing a robotic system rather than one of those? How would you tackle that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think it sort of depends on what, uh, what the intent of the program is larger. You know, I think, um, you know, the way we've approached it here in Boston is that we're trying to create a, like I've, you know, like we talked about a multidisciplinary program, bringing in all of our colleagues from uh, pulmonary, interventional pulmonary, as well as radiology and, and thoracic surgery and oncology to, 
you know, think about creating a lung nodule lung cancer program starting from, you know, lung cancer screening and then going all the way to, you know, met- management of metastatic lung cancer. And the way that we've thought the robot fits into that program is it does allow us um, to uh, bring in more patients. I think there is some, uh, you know, uh, some buzz about robotic bronchoscopy out in the in the field, and I think we have found it to help us bring in, you know, more patients in terms of, you know, lung nodule referrals. And I think that's helped version the whole program. Um, you know, the other thing that we've talked about uh, and built the program around is, is the research. And I think there are a lot of research questions that are still unanswered about robotic bronchoscopy, you know, including comparisons to some of the other technologies that you mentioned or some of the other platforms that are out there. Um, and that's why we've sort of built our program. And that's why it's been worth it to us to have robotic bronchoscopy here um, in, in, in that sense. I think there's, a, there's unanswered questions in terms of uh, how to compare this platform, robotic bronchoscopy, versus you know the other ones you mentioned, like Super D and Varin, uh, Illumisite, which which is now the newer name I think for Super Dimensions. Um, there's no head-to-head comparisons out there. You know, I think the way that uh, um, we, we we've sort of uh, embraced robotic bronchoscopy is some of the things that we've already started to talk about, like the stability and the precision that the platform allows, which I think is in some ways superior to at least what I felt anecdotally compared to some of the other non-robotic platforms. Um, and that's, that's why we've sort of leaned on it a bit more. Yeah. And then, and then Dr. O, if you then take the two robotic bronchoscopic systems that are out there, one of the biggest criticisms of the ION system is, of course, the lack of direct visualization. And, and somebody asked, do you think that direct visualization of the lesion increases the yield? Before you answer that, you know, we, we, I think that it's still emerging technology. A lot of data is yet to come out. But, but I, I guess I would cite the most recent kind of benefit study that came out that showed a 74% diagnostic yield for median nodule size of about 2.3 centimeters. Um, and we're still awaiting kind of a large uh, multi-center um, final diagnostic yield per median size for patients on the ion side. But the data that are out there range anywhere from you know, 82, 83% to anywhere up to 93% based on the study and the series. So, so they appear to be comparable. Uh, do you think the vision with the ION makes a big difference? So I think um, both platforms are, I think, meaningful improvements uh, uh, compared to uh, previous technologies. Whether one will end up being superior than the other one, the scientist in me says, I don't know. Um, but I do not think that vision is as important as we might think as, uh, initial, because after, after you take your first biopsy, you can't see anything anyways, uh, the majority of the time. So really it's the initial vision that lets you get to where you want to get to, um, direct the, your tool, your biopsy tool in the area or the target that you want to direct it to. And then after your first pass, it's everything's red. So I'm not sure that maintaining vision at that time is helpful. Two is a lot of times lesions are extra luminal. You'll see a normal airway in one, you'll see a normal airway in the other. So I'm not sure it's helpful in that way either. Um, So understand the anatomy and um, knowing where your lesion is related to the airway, I think are the most important thing. And then the last piece of the puzzle is are you going to be using a real-time imaging confirmation of tool and target, which I think at that point makes even less of a difference of whether or not you're able to uh, maintain uh, endobronchial visualization of the target, because really who cares what you see endobronchial that you want to see your tool in the target. Um, So in the end, I don't think it makes as much of a difference as it might seem to make, although it's comforting because it's kind of what we're used to, right? With our our bronchoscopes that we use now. So it's a little bit reassuring in that way. But personally, I I don't think it's as critical as it may seem um, initially. You know, it brings up another question because because one perceived advantage of of the Monarch system is the 
visualization, one perceived advantage of the ion system is the catheter size, because you go from a five millimeter catheter size to a three millimeter catheter size. And some on the call may or may not know that the ion system originally did have direct visualization attached to it. And then more recent iterations uh, before the product became commercial, um, eliminated that direct visualization to narrow down the catheter size. I, uh, I'm not on anybody's payroll when I say this. I think there just needs to be more data to show if that two millimeters makes a difference and if that vision, you know, makes a difference. I think another important piece of the comparison is the shape sensing technology. And I, I think that is in, in many ways a, a, an improvement over the way that we've previously done this using electromagnetic navigation alone. Um, I have, you know, I have been very impressed with the precision that comes with the shape sensing. And I think in, in, in some ways, and I think we're, we've said this over and over again, but it remain, it's important to restate it that the, the data should show this and, and we'll, we need to do this to confirm it. But at least my feeling is, that the accuracy of shape sensing is superior to electromagnetic navigation, but yeah. it's, it's an important study that needs to be done. It ties into a, the perfect question that looks like Yvonne Carter is asking, which is, are you guys using PEEP and breath hold to account for atelectasis and help increase diagnostic yield? And our institution, we have developed very strict anesthesia parameters. I use a PEEP of 12 for upper lobes, 15 for lower lobes, and then we sequentially increase based on airway size, or if patient is intolerant of those high peeps, then we bring it down. Uh, the point is we have very regimented anesthesia protocols. We do use PEEP. We use the mobile CT imaging to help identify divergence when it's going on. And when we, when we um, did our first prospective study of 30 patients with that mobile CT, we were actually able to measure the catheter shape and orientation when we were pointed at the virtual target and then the catheter shape and orientation when we were pointed at the target on real-time CT. And what we found is that 60% of the time there was divergence and it ranged anywhere from 10 millimeters to 22 millimeters based on upper lobe or lower lobe lesions. So I think it's really important when we talk about these different navigation systems, you can't tie diagnostic yield to navigation yield. The two are not the same. You have to figure out a way to overcome that CT to body divergence. And I think it's a combination of the navigation and how good the planning software is, your ability to control what you can, and that speaks to the anesthesia parameters, and then your real-time tools, whether it's radial EBUS, whether it's mobile CT, whether it's cone beam CT, those are all toolkits to help. And you may not use all of them depending on the nodule, but they're all good to have. Um, any comments from either of you on that? Yeah, we definitely use a high peep, um, somewhere between 10 and 15. We use relatively high tidal volumes of 10 to 12 cc's uh, per kg. Uh, breath hold, um, we do, especially for challenging targets. One of the things I do, uh, depending on how challenging the target is and how good the radial EBUS is, I leave the radial EBUS in and I look at the radial EBUS signal during the breath cycle. And if the radial EBA stays within the target during the whole breath cycle, and I use fluoro at that time as well to see how much movement there is of the uh, radial EBA's probe and the catheter and the lung and everything else. And if it looks like it doesn't matter where in the breath cycle I put my tool out, it's going to be in the lesion, then I, I don't necessarily do a breath hold. But for particularly challenging cases where you really want the maximum level of precision, we do do a, a breath hold. Dr. Parikh, do you guys yeah. always do a breath hold sometimes? Uh, no, not, not very often, actually. I don't yeah. use the breath hold that much. I, I, I certainly use that technique that Dr. O describes where you, you really want to get a sense of what the radial EBUS looks like through the respiratory cycle because that gives a lot of information about how things may move as you biopsy them. Uh, but we also have a protocol in place where we use uh, high PEEP. Ours is usually about 10 to 12 um, and tidal volumes of about 8 to 10 cc's per kilo. Um, we, there are some published data on using uh, reduced FiO2s. We had, it was a discussion with our anesthesiologist. They didn't feel so comfortable going very low on the FiO2. So we usually hover somewhere around 40 to 50%. Uh, but I don't, I don't know if you guys have, have employed that part of the protocol as well. We have. We start low and then uh, give uh, the anesthesiologist the leeway to increase as needed, which okay. uh, makes them feel more comfortable that, uh, to go lower. Yeah. 
It's good. Empower the anesthesiologist. It's the key <laughs> to success of all anesthesia related procedures. Uh, what's the smallest bend radius you guys have seen in a biopsy? For me, I think I would say six, seven, in which case you can't use a forceps, but we have used the mini forceps at that tip bend radius and use the passive feature to go passive, pass the forceps and then go active. What about you guys? I think eight. My, I don't know. I'd, I'd, I'd have to go back. I think I've seen an eight. Yeah, I have to say single digits. I can't remember exactly what the number is, but uh, we have done single digits. And similar to your situation where we try to get a tool through without having to do the to relax the catheter. But if we have to and, have, and then redirect, that's what we do. Yeah. Um, you know, just the, the company parting line is is 15 millimeters for, for tool passage. Uh, but the needles obviously pass at 10. I've had the forceps sometimes pass at 10 too. There's that feature where you can go passive, you know, like we talked about. And then, and then um, anybody use this for multiple nodules, bilateral nodules, pneumonectomies? I've used it in uh, the most targets I've gone after is three, two in one side, one in the other, bilateral. Um, Post lung transplant works fine. Um, and uh, lobectomy. I haven't done a pneumonectomy case, I have to say, but have done uh, lobectomy cases. I did a pneumonectomy. I did that one in cone beam CT just to make sure I didn't do anything super dangerous um, because it was a pericardial lesion in a pneumonectomy patient, but it went okay. Um, just to reiterate, it's important to use that partial registration feature. And as long as you've got a good registration on the side that you're biopsying on, it, 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 it has worked out so far so good. Yeah, I think I've gone after the most is two lesions, uh, and those are bilateral. And we've certainly done lobectomy patients, um, but no pneumonectomies, I don't think. And the lobectomies did fine. Um, has anybody um, done a case, got non-diagnostic, sent the patient to CT, and then they've had trouble seeing the lesion because of whatever you did robotically? I, I haven't yet, but I, you know, who know it could happen. Not saying it couldn't. Has anything like that happened with you guys? I mean, at the point I'm trying to make is I think relatively speaking, the trauma that we cause is, is fairly low, uh, despite all the tools at our disposal. Yeah. Well, yeah, we actually had a case last week. It, it totally, it was the opposite situation where we actually had trouble finding the lesion, um, uh, during the, uh, the procedure itself, the radial abyss images weren't great. We ended up doing a biopsy, it became non-diagnostic, and then the follow-up CT scan showed the lesion had actually disappeared. Um, and so, you know, I think uh, it, we, we have a protocol in place where the CTs have to be done within 30 days of the procedure. That's sort of our standard practice, but, you know, I wonder, there's, there, there was a study done out of Hopkins where they were doing the same day CT scans, and they were finding that, you know, I think they had a 7% cancellation rate based on the lesions improving, improving radiographically. Um, I don't know what you guys' practices are. Or have you come across that at all? Well, a quick follow-up question, though, on that. Are you having issues running into billing when you're mandating that a patient get a repeat CT for a nav bronch, or, or, or have you not had insurance issues with that? We haven't. I, I, can, I, I don't think that we have. I've not heard of any. It's very uh, insurance-dependent for us uh, in the time frame that's passed. Um, if, if we try to get one within 30 days, it's virtually nearly impossible unless the patient's willing to pay out of pocket. Uh, after two months, uh, after 60 days, we pretty much can get it pretty easily. Yeah. Um, between the 30 and 60 has been very, highly, highly variable and oftentimes requires a peer-to-peer. -peer. Same. I, I, I same here, which is why, again, it goes back to the radiomics piece of it about is it speculated, has it had growth history? Because if it's done all of those things and it's a CT that's compliable, I tend to stretch it to 60 days if I can. Uh, but, but you know, obviously, if there are suggestive features of inflammation or infection, then I think you can sometimes get insurance to bite on a non-invasive CT uh, as opposed to another, in, as opposed to an invasive uh, procedure. One of the biggest challenges we have is the format of the CT because you want a, a nice quality CT to get uh, the, the virtual planning uh, software to have clean images. And a lot of the outside scans are, you know, three millimeter cuts or whatever they may be are not very good. So yeah. the first thing I do is call the radiology center and say, do you still have the raw data? Can you reformat it? And uh, that has saved me 
many, many times in, in uh, not having to do a repeat CT, um, depending on how long the centers keep the raw data. What's a, what's your ideal slice cut? I mean, I, it's funny, like I, I still remember the days when like three millimeters was awesome. And then we had one millimeter and now we get 0.75 millimeter cuts on everybody for a nodule CT that's done here locally. What about you guys? Yeah, at least a millimeter. Uh, my minimum is millimeter uh, one by one. Uh, I like to, if it's one millimeter cuts, I like to have a little bit of overlap. I feel like the airway trees are a little cleaner that way. But, but the best I've seen is 0.65 every 0.5. I mean, it was like uh, it was it was like HD TV there. <laughs> what about you, Dr. Parikh? What what uh, what kind of CT slices are you ideally looking for? I mean, always now I sound like a pathologist, the smaller the <laughs> but uh, what <laughs> what do you shoot for? I feel like we're in the dark ages. We're at about 1.25 millimeters for most oh, yeah. of our scans on our nodule protocols. Um, you know, maybe we should dig into that a little bit. But that being said, I haven't really experienced a lot of issues. The airway segmentation always looks real pretty, um, and we don't tend to have much problems. But now I want better. <laughs> <laughs> Send you our protocol. Our protocol. Yeah. Um, anybody have any issues with billing for robotic bronchoscopy? Have you had issues with patients, insurance not taking it, or, or anything like that? Boy, no, we've had zero zero issues. Yeah, same. It hasn't been a, an issue at all. Uh, same here. There, there are a couple of things, though, that I think are important to mention when you dictate the cases. I always mention that you you use the computer to generate a, a pre-planned navigation pathway for those that are on the call that may not have used SuperD or anything and are going straight from radial EBUS to robotic because there is an extra... Uh, billable ICD code if you're using a pre-planning computer-generated software. So that's important to put in your dictation. And then if you are using Conebeam CT or mobile CT during your cases, it's important to mention that in your dictation as well, because you might possibly be able to be reimbursed for the use of computer or uh, real-time CT imaging during your cases as well. Those are the kind of two pearls I have there. Any other uh, pearls on how to dictate so that you feel like you're being adequately reimbursed? No, I think, uh, I, I don't know how many people are on Epic or whatever system you use, just get that initial template done correctly and use it over and over. Yeah. Uh, any correlation between the feel of the nodule during the biopsy and the pathologic outcome in terms of benign versus malignant? Dr. Parikh, any, have you noticed like when you, Puncture, do you notice a difference between benign and malignant? Can you tell? It's hard to get that level of feedback I've found. I think a lot of the feedback you get is just from, you know, the passing of the needle. So I haven't really experienced that uh, as much. Um, you know, I think it, you do have visualization as you're getting out there and certainly um, you get a good sense when you're entering the airways, if there, you know, if there is an endobronchial lesion, you can get a good sense of what it looks like. And that is something that's been a change. I use, I use, you know, platforms beforehand where you weren't really able to see the airways when you're out there. So that certainly helps. Uh, but I agree with Dr. Oh, he mentioned this a while ago that the majority of the lesions that I we, we're seeing, even the ones really far out are an extra luminal. We're not really seeing much endoluminal there. Yeah. Dr. Oh, do you feel a difference? I, I, I agree. I'm not, I can't palpate much of a difference. Yeah. I think it really just happens to do with uh, how much bend there is in the catheter the resistance of that bed uh, more than the density of the tissue. I will say one thing that I have found in the difference between benign and malignant is that our pathologists are really, really good at identifying malignant. Our pathologists are really, really hard. It's really hard for them to call benign, like really hard. And so I think as we start to see some of this diagnostic yield data come out, a little bit of that is, is hard to interpret because the smaller you get, the higher the likelihood of benign. And again, no matter how good your technology is, pathologists really, really struggle to call benign. And the, the scientific purists in us are like, oh, unless I see granulomas, it's non-diagnostic. But should the technology be dinged for that or should the nodule, you know? What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, the, the clinical outcome would be, you know, you get to a point where you feel comfortable not doing another scan. <laughs> and, and if you get to a point where you're like, I feel so comfortable with the data I have, 
I'm not going to biopsy it again. I'm not going to scan it again. Then even if your biopsy was quote unquote non-diagnostic, you've reached a meaningful clinical endpoint, whether that be a year or six months or three months if the lesion is gone on follow-up imaging. You know, I think that's the kind of hard endpoint that uh, the clinical endpoint that's, that's meaningful. I mean, we've all had cases where you biopsy at nonspecific inflammation and then uh, you uh, get a repeat scan and it's gone. And that's why it was nonspecific inflammation. But other cases where you did find that and it ended up being a cancer. Um, so uh, I think um, we need solid, hard, uh, clinically relevant endpoints to really get a sense of the diagnostic yield. I think it also speaks to the fact that the communication between us and the pathologist needs to be you know, really, really good. I think that, that these, these channels of communication need to be open. They need to be constant. They, they, they get a lot of information. They get a lot of, their, their calls are much more powerful when they can they talk to us about what our feel is, what the lesion looks like radiographically, what the history of the patient is. That really plays into what they're seeing. It's not simply what they're seeing under the microscope. They're taking in a lot of information that we can give them to really come to a diagnosis. And I think as we go for, you know, smaller and smaller and, 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 more peripheral lesions, we need to be better about communicating with them. We got about four minutes left. I want to spend a couple minutes on, on a question that comes up often. And, and Dr. O, you've appropriately coined the term. So I'll start with you. What do you see as the future of robotic bronchoscopy, particularly with respect to opportunities for therapeutic intervention? Yeah, so I'm gonna if you I'm gonna uh, divulge me. <laughs> um, I'm gonna share a, a screen, my screen, real quick here. And is that popping up? I think hopefully it's popping up. So this is uh, I feel like the future of robotic bronchoscopy is here, where Dr. Parikh mentioned that it's a one-stop shop where we diagnose, where we stage, and we offer treatment. But the way I envision treatment for cancer is going to be similar to heart or HIV, where we target and treat lung cancer simultaneously, even early stage sometimes, for, with multimodality regimens to maximize the, the treatment outcome. And that's highly, highly active anti-tumor therapy, uh, where we deliver and we diagnose, we stage, and for treatment, we deliver an energy. What that energy turns out to be, I think, is going to be yet to be determined, whether it's cryo because it preserves neoantigens that elicits a better inflammatory response than heat therapies that denature proteins, whether it's electroporation, uh, brachytherapy, PDT, um, who knows what energy we can deliver through uh, a catheter. Uh, then we're going to inject locally with small molecules that augment uh, systemic therapies. And I think this kind of multimodality, multi-pronged approach is going to be what, le what ultimately leads to better outcomes in lung cancer, similar to the, the treatment of high blood pressure or HIV, where we, we target multiple path pathways simultaneously. So that's kind of where I see the future of, of robotic uh, bronchoscopy going. And that's just to talk about cancer, right? We're really focused on cancer here, but there are a lot of diseases that aren't cancer where I, I feel like uh, this platform could also be uh, useful in. So that's a whole nother uh, uh, ball of wax. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll just throw in my two cents. I mean, we're currently already doing single stage biopsy staging, localization, and then resection. We're currently doing a study where we've got health systems engineers evaluating that patient response or if they come in and do it all at once versus the anxiety and the cost associated with the travel and multiple appointments and the multiple positions and the back and forth and the time that they're sitting there waiting with, with, with uh, ambiguous results and next steps. Um, and so aside from all the promises of, of endoluminal therapeutics, there's a role for single stage biopsy localization and resection right now. And I, and I think we're doing that. And, and then I think to your point, there's going to be a population where um, I'm saying this as a surgeon, surgery is not going to be the answer to all of these and, and endoluminal therapies will be the answer to a proportion of them. And so obviously, we'll, it's exciting to see what the future holds for those. Dr. Parikh, I'll give you closing comments here. 
Uh, no, I totally agree. I'm excited to see what the future will bring. I think, you know, at first I'm curious to see how, how accurate we are. I think before we start talking about therapeutics, we really need to prove the accuracy of the, of the platform. And I think we're, we're at that phase right now, and hopefully that's going to pan out to what uh, we're anecdotally getting these abstracts from chess showing pretty good, uh, pretty good diagnostic yields. And I think the next step is, is as a larger study to confirm that and then therapeutics soon after. Uh, we're, we're out of time. I just want to thank the panelists again. Fantastic discussion. Big, big, big thanks to Chess for hosting this platform. And then, of course, to all the attendees and the very thoughtful uh, questions and commentary. Please feel free to email us afterwards offline if further questions or comments come up. Um, I'd ask the panelists to stay on for just a few minutes for a debrief. Otherwise, thanks, everyone, and happy Thursday night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.